Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, TPA webinar on um, how to deal with your digital transformation in practice. And today we will be pre presenting TPA's 2020 tax automation playbook, which will discuss the um, practical methods in dealing with your digital transformation in practice. Before we begin, I'd like to address a few housekeeping methods, matters. Um, everyone is on mute. And uh, if you have questions, please post them in the control panel and we will address the questions at the end of the session. Um, one of the main speakers today is Jeff Peck, who is a partner to TPA Global and he is dedicated, he's a taxologist who is dedicated in helping today's tax professionals and others to understand the digitalization of tax. And another presenter is, uh, many of you already know, uh, Steve Hobrakta, who is the CEO of TPA Global. And TPA Global is also committed to help our clients to deal with uh, tax, digital, tax and other digital transformation. On that note, I will pass the floor to Steph. Thanks, Emily. And uh, Jeff, you're online as well. Huh? I am indeed. Uh, hello, everyone. Very good. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, we, uh, we want to give you a little bit of context. Uh, TPA has, uh, has been launching or will be launching three playbooks. Uh, playbooks is just a visual way of uh, dealing with very complex issues, so, such as digital transformation and tax technology. Um, First playbook we will address today, that's the 2020 tax automation playbook. Um, and, and as the title says, how to deal with things in practice. Um, certainly with uh, Jeff, his uh, wide background uh, on uh, uh, making his hands dirty on data and technology uh, is, is, um, is, is very important to have uh, him online. Um, a second playbook, which we will run in a set similar webinar as today, which will address uh, what we call 2020 Next Generation Compliance Factories, where the technology of today with some human intervention will lead to a new standard of, uh, of, of um, uh, tax compliance. Uh, that's, that's the second playbook. Uh, once you, as an organization, are mature, maturing on tax and technology, that's, that's the next option. Uh, once you've gone through the two playbooks, the third playbook will, will deal with tax uh, and business data analytics, um, where, where obviously the, the whole wealth of data you're looking at with the proper quality, integrity, and data analytics will lead also to very interesting analytics, uh, not only for tax, uh, and tax risk management, but also for business purposes. So, so having said that, um, we uh, are uh, also very aware that any tax project, and that's sort of the, the red thread through our conversation today, uh, is only going to be successful if uh, you can mobilize the people. So I, I think our sequence uh, doesn't start with technology, doesn't start with uh, a process to professionalize and digitize, but it starts with the people. So people, process, technology, is, uh, it's, uh, we believe, the secret to a successful digital transformation project. With that, uh, I'm, I'm just um, looking at, uh, at the first slide. Um, and the first slide is uh, all um, from our website. The, the proposition TPA is involved in is tax and legal, including transfer pricing and valuation and value chain analysis. A, a lot of things said about governance model for tax and, and finance, which uh, in, in some organizations is, uh, is only at the early stages. And if you understand you don't have a, a clear governance structure, um, you might be automating uh, chaos. Um, Digital transformation, second to the a box on our, on our website, is all about digital that works. So we, 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 we do connect with software packages which uh, run at least with 10 large corporates. Otherwise, uh, we, we don't want any guinea pigs uh, around. Then the compliance factory, I was just eluding on that playbook, is all about tax and control. That's really what the CFO uh, is it's, uh, in need of. 
and and uh, more and more uh, on a on a real time base. And then obviously um, the third playbook, tax data analytics, that I was telling you about a minute ago, um, is is another way of looking at tax risk management. So that's the the fourth box: tax litigation and mediation for which uh, TPA has a global tax controversy um, alternative network of, uh, of tax litigators. Uh, so so that's sort of setting the theme for, um, if, you, if you look on the, the next slide, uh, with the, the introduction, um, the reintroduction of our network with 5,000 plus people and a few pictures of people who actually work uh, almost without exception, I, I see Jeff there, he's in the UK, but uh, these the different nationalities all work in the Amsterdam office. With that, uh, I'm, I'm handing over on the next slide uh, the, the why to, to, to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so, yeah, let's have a look at the why behind tax and technology. So, yeah, next slide. So multinationals are facing a growing compliance challenge as technology broadens its scope cross-functionally. So it's not just the head of tax involved, but the CFO and heads of procurement, legal and regulatory. Um, next slide, please, Emily. Uh, and the reasons that we see this happening, we've, we've grouped these together into three main agents of change. Um, the first is politicization. So this is eroded public perception of multinational corporation tax positions, pressure from media and public committees, and more aggressive scrutiny from the tax authorities. So in turn, this is raising the profile of tax internally at corporations, and we're seeing that this agent of change is advancing quickly. Secondly, digitalization. So the stronger digital links between taxpayers and authorities, and they are requesting larger quantities of raw data in near real time as they build up their own digital profiles of their taxpayers. So tax must be uh, must place a greater emphasis on data as technology becomes a bigger part of new regulations such as e-invoicing and live reporting. So this is over time blurring the distinction between tax and technology. So you know where does one stop and where does the other start? And tax managers are going to have to learn to defend themselves against authorities who are going to be looking to interpret all this data that they're gathering in a negative way. And we're seeing this agent of change also advancing quickly. The third one is transformation. And to cut a long story short here, and Stay40 um, alluded to this, this one is really about people. So tax professionals going forward are going to need a, a better technical awareness more digital skills and in varying degrees, depending on the role that they play, tax data literacy. And, and we come back to that on a later slide. And it also means graduating your mindset from pure enterprise process automation to people, process and technology. Again, something Steve already mentioned. And they're gonna have to accept going forward uh, that continuous innovation is the new constant which means that uh, innovation is going to be part of everybody's daily activities and not always a separate project. However, we're finding that this agent of change is advancing slowly in corporations. It's uh, struggling a little. Um, we're all familiar with the actual events uh, like Brexit, the OECD guidelines, so SAFT, country by country reporting, BEPS 2.0, Pillars 1 and 2. New mandatory disclosures from the EU like DAC6, tax reform and way wayfair in the US, ETMRC is making tax digital in the UK, taxing the digital economy uh, and all that, never mind so the global trade disputes that we're going, that we see going on, and the recent new measures around COVID-19. So in general, in future, we're going to see more tax legislation, regulation, and greater compliance burdens than ever before. And out of that, we can expect higher tax bills, more complex audits, and increased controversy. So can we move to the next slide, please, Emily? So this is leaving the head of tax in something of a catch-22 situation. 
caught between the tax authorities who are both demanding more and needing more attention and the CFO who is constantly looking for more delivery at less cost, so more for less. Um, and I think at that point I'm handing over to Emily. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, in the next section, um, I will uh, briefly discuss uh, what the plan is you would uh, need to implement a tax technology uh, project. This slide uh, shows an illustration of um, the elements that could be included in a tax technology plan. First of all, um, setting the objective is very important in defining a clear tax technology strategy. So it means that you would need to address what are the main areas of concern and you would need to review how your tax analytics and compliance are dealt with. And for your organization and governance, uh, you need to assess who is doing what, uh, obvious but very important, and also how much involvement that uh, you would want of an external, of the external consultant you ha have uh, or you uh, or in-house that you already have uh, as resources in your organization involved for the project. And you would also need to assess the which workflows are most complex and non-repetitive and at the same time, also look at which workflows are simple and repetitive. And these are the workflows that you may want to automate. For the output, uh, um, you would need to consider what kind of data you want to have uh, instant access to and how the, how the data is currently being collected and compiled. And also define how you would want to see out any outliers and inconsistencies uh, in the data identified. And uh, for functionalities, um, you would need to assess the, what kind of reporting um, is the functionalities you would want to have as a result of the uh, technology um, project. And also, you may, and for with any plan, you may need to review or revise the plan on a regular or a, or a need basis. Yeah, a, a, a few points here, um, Emily and. And, and Jeff chime in if, if, uh, if you have comments on that. I think this this plan, this approach, the objectives could be, I, I first want to standardize and automate uh, workflows of VAT or tax accounting and later on on corporate income tax and, and um, uh, transfer pricing. Um, if, if you choose uh, in uh, number five, your functionality, which drives uh, your vendor selection process for software. Um, you you can obviously uh, do that in saying, okay, I want an end-to-end -end, uh, end -end software application which deals with indirect tax in 60 countries where VAT and GST is running. Does such a system exist? Yes, it exists. Is it being chosen a lot? Well, not. Not really, because it's it's relatively complex, like any ERP end-to-end -end system. Uh, in this case, ERP system on tax. So it scares people, tax people in particular, away because they heard the horror stories from rolling out an ERP system for for finance. So if you, however, take uh, the approach where you say, "Fab, uh, I'm going to." Uh, run this cycle and plan for VAT the purposes first, and then two years down the road, I'm going to do tax accounting, and then two years later, or even two months later, if you're very uh, fast, uh, I'm going to do a corporate income tax. Then what we see happening is a fragmentation of software solutions. So people take a fit-for-purpose solution, where the software, uh, the fit-for-purpose uh, software solution doesn't necessarily communicate with the other. The, the positive is it, it's piecemeal and therefore the breakdown and the failure risk might be lower. Uh, the negative is that data sets need to be replicated to, to different softwares um, uh, on a multiple base. And if you change the data set in, on one piece of application and you forget to change it on the other, the systems are not necessarily aligned anymore. Uh, so uh, be aware that this is a fundamental part of uh, of this cycle. 
um, are you are you in uh, for an end to end? Um, and, and in some cases, like a, a rollout of that technology, you might actually have to consider that. Um, or are you in for um, standalone solutions where at least someone needs to look um, as a taxologist like like Jeff needs to look at the cohesiveness of data sets and data architecture. Uh, Jeff, anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think you've covered that well, Steve. Um, I think the next slide is uh, uh, then the the whole discussion about data architecture. I already started alluding on that. So is the data organization, um, uh, which typically is a top challenge for digital transformation. So organizing, uh, so data gets created because you have transaction flows of goods and services. Uh, then data gets uh, uh, created because you hire people and there's an HR department and there's a general ledger on salary cost. That, that's all where data gets uh, uh, created. Then data gets stored. And then the question is which data uh, and which modern data architecture can you implement uh, in a cloud-based data warehouse which works in a seemingly harm harmonious way with your tax needs. Well, that, that system is, is always hard to get. So here are a few questions for you as an audience, but also if you talk to other stakeholders, because these approaches are always multidisciplinary in, the, in any multinational. So what, what is the, the governance on data? Is there a manual, on, on for example, on data definitions? Um, how do you work in multidisciplinary teams uh, with finance, IT, and tax professionals? We hear a lot of in-house people who say we're struggling to get some funding for this software package or software or, or transformation project. Uh, we don't know whether to knock on the door of finance or IT or, or whether the CFO wants to, to help us with the budget uh, for, for tax. So, so then the, the question comes up, um, should you be looking for a separate isolated data architecture for tax? Is that really what you want to do? Because that obviously doubles the amount of data into the system and it, inc it increases typically the amount of errors uh, in, in further uh, working that tax-oriented data into, uh, into tax forms. Uh, so, so your your question could be: Can we leverage from the data architecture uh, our finance colleagues already created, and, and what are what are really the best practices over the last couple of years when finance and IT people work together? Uh, what practice, best practices did they leave behind, and uh, which we can leverage from as 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 a tax team? So I think here is where the 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 heart of the matter lies. If you start a project. Data architecture is, is very important. If we then look at the next slide where we say, okay, you create data uh, through HR, manufacturing, sales and purchases, and, and now you need to store it. But there's different visualizations on how you uh, store data. In this case, we have a transactional data layer, finance and tax layer, uh, but also a, a separate layer which deals with the legal and contractual realities um, of of these uh, of these data points, this all could lead to uh, a an, an, uh, structured, um, orchestrated uh, data sets in, into a tax compliance engine, which, as an output, will will be filling tax forms, which can be filed with the tax authority. So this is a I call this the simplified version of data architecture. Um, if we if we move to the next slide, actually that, that's where you get a little bit more into the reality of, of what most uh, corporates are looking at. They will have uh, physical flows of goods and services and, and other source uh, uh, sources of data, which, which is, are fed in a transactional database, third party as well as in the, in the company. Uh, which are registered in the regular ERP or non-ERP 
data fields and, and source uh, source data platforms, um, which through a conversion engine are all being transformed to um, a universal text data standard, which we call the text data file or the text data lake, uh, which then, uh, based on that harmonized and consistent uh, data definitions you need for taxes, um, spits out uh, various tax forms uh, to be shared with uh, the, the tax authorities. So this is, um, I guess, uh, a, a very commonly used visualization of data architecture. Uh, the, the question on, on, on where you start with a plan uh, Emily was talking about is uh, you start with data. So data is of the essence. It's, it's really the garbage in, garbage out model. And, and um, uh, during our webinar on the playbook number three, tax and business data analytics, we will um, elude a little bit further on what is data really doing for you and how can data analytics, especially when it, it feeds into business data analytics, uh, upgrade you, you your your role in, of the tax department uh, and suddenly become valuable to the business community and the board uh, level as well. So with that, I I I'm handing over the the next slide to to you, Jeff. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so yes, um, in terms of um, what Steve was just talking about, um, data. Um, but also tax solutions that we've had available on the market pretty much since the beginning, tax technology products. They classify quite nicely into three groups or generations, if you like. So the first generation, um, bottom left there, is standalone tax software. So these are uh, standalone tools or point solutions that generally perform a single function. Uh, they've been around quite a long time and one way to think about them is like one step up from a spreadsheet but that said some of them can actually be very sophisticated but they tend to have a problem like a spreadsheet is that they trap data inside them and they mold it to their own needs and thereby that data loses its properties as a generic multi-purpose representation of the business and I know Stafe likes to call these uh, these particular products one trick ponies. Uh, the second group, the middle group. Um, so these are more siloed applications and do share some data. And again, a good example of those is the VAT compliance tools um, that share data across uh, different outputs like VAT returns, EC sales lists, Interstat, SAFT for many EU countries and countries beyond the EU as well. So that's you know an expansion and sharing, but not the, not the full enchilada, not yet. We also in this group include the tax engines. Um, so things like the Thomson Reuters One Source Indirect Tax Determination, previously known as Sabrix or Vertex O series. Um, the problem tends to be a little bit with this group is that they're quite heavyweight. They need IT support and they still trap data inside them. Um, and the reason we know that is because so far the vendor's efforts to tack on analytics to some of these tools has not been very successful. And that's because the data in them has not been set up for generic use. The third generation tax platforms, top right. Um, this one is really just taking shape. This is the state of the art. And this is based around, uh, and actually to um, elaborate on one or two of the things that you said about data safe. So this is um, talking about a single source of truth tax data lake, where actually that, that lake becomes a 360 degree virtual reality view of your entire organization through tax tinted glasses. Um, an important characteristic of this from a data perspective is that you decouple the data from the process. So the two other categories, they just wrap all the data, tightly bind it into the process, and then you can't get it out again. But with a tax solution platform, it very much separates the data and you deal with the data first. Um, and then the processes that you're gonna use it for afterwards. Um, and 
But in order to make that happen, uh, your tax professionals have to become a little bit more tech savvy and digitally aware, as we talked about with transformation. Um, you also, no, not yet. I'm still, can we please go back to the last slide again? Sorry, I haven't finished with that one yet. Um, so I, I just want to say in here as well that you do have some different options on the on the top one, on the tax solution platforms. It doesn't have to be all IT. You can start to use some democratized and commoditized products. And I'll mention a couple of those in a minute. Um, and also just to mention that although these might be seen as generations, one does not replace the other. All three are still quite in common use. So the standalone tax software is still very popular for corporation tax solutions. The middle one is very popular around ERP and will probably stay that way. Um, and the tax solution platforms, well, those are new, but are a key part of any tax function that wants to digitalize. Okay, now we can go to the next slide, please, Emily. So in terms of those new skills that we talked about, become more tech savvy and digitally aware. So, um, and any tax function that plans to make digital tax a deliverable is gonna need to deal with these roles in one way or another. It doesn't necessarily mean you need four new people. Um, it's just that these roles, um, they could be spread around a restructured and upskill team that's made up of your existing tax professionals and any any tax IT people that you may already have. So the ERP tax data modeler, this is a key new role and definitely on the IT side of the house, but it emphasizes data, which is something that has in general been, most in, been missing from most ERP projects to date. The second one is the tax data analyst. And this role is critical for any tax department that wants to digitalize. The tools they use might, with, within a tax data lake or refinery, we've called it here, um, might be scripting languages uh, like Python or JavaScript, or robotics tools of which UiPath is, is the leading product out there. And that's what I mean by democratized and, com and commoditized products. So democratized because they're easier to use. You don't have to be an IT professional. And commoditized because they're cheaper. Um, and you would generally get those via subscription rather than licensing. The next one, tax data miner. So the tax data miner's job is to ensure that strategic decision making within the tax department is based on data. So they are using advanced analytic tools to look for patterns, anomalies, and statistical significance, um, representing them on dashboards and using spreadsheets as a presentation tool. So uh, some people say um, Excel should go away. We believe it shouldn't. It's a very good presentation tool, but it should not be used to manipulate your data. That's where the tax data lake comes in. Lastly, the taxologist. Now the taxologist is the architect that holds the whole digital edifice, edifice together. And over time, weaves it into the very fabric of the tax function. Now this is definitely the most difficult role to fill and maybe the one that is a new role if, uh, unless you've got somebody who's very talented uh, with the uh, technology space, not just the tools themselves, but actually understanding how to architect the entire structure. Um, or you appoint somebody who's supported by somebody like TPA Global or somebody else like us. Um, there, of the traditional tax roles, there's only one that we see might disappear altogether going forward, and that's the role of the traditional tax preparer. Because going forward, that role is simply not going to make sense once the tax authority move more towards digital live reporting. So, um, yeah, that's me handing over again. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, this, this is sort of uh, what, what I would call um, as a, what, what technology is doing. Is, it's basically in each industry doing a, a reset between how the human brain interacts with the computer brain or the software brain. And, and obviously, that, that is always perceived and presented as a threat to the human brain. I think this, this slide uh, Jeff was just um, uh, showcasing is, is giving you also the, 
the bright perspective, uh, there's new roles coming up. And, and if you're the right guy, the right talent with the right interest, there's new roles uh, to, to, for the grab. And I think that that's also giving the people uh, who are uh, tax uh, trained knowledge workers uh, another perspective. So the, the people process technology sequence uh, uh, we, we like to follow is all about uh, getting the people, uh, giving the people a positive perspective into the future with some in inspiration to go with it because then it makes transformation a lot easier. And, and actually, uh, that's the only recipe for, for a successful transformation project. Okay, um, examples? Yeah, so in this section, we will go through examples of uh, implementing technologies into um, tech workflows. Okay, so would you like to take us through the first uh, couple of examples? Yeah, the first one is a little bit condensed in terms of the uh, 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 text so so don't read all of it because you might get lost uh, what basically one of our clients did they they uh, projected the the process they they gone through from data uh, retrieval from uh, ERP system all the way to producing a TP document and and it as part of that whole process we uh, we analyzed uh, process improvements uh, well first we uh, uh, as I just said, we first looked at the roles of people and, and did a, a reset on that. Then we, we said, okay, is the process uh, an optimum process? And if, if not, uh, where can we standardize and where can we uh, bring in the technology? So this is a full um, uh, process flow of the production of say a local TP file described by a client with suggestions from our side how to uh, optimize uh, that that whole that whole workflow again taking people process and technology into account um, second uh, case is one of the questions uh, we, we always get out uh, should I outsource or insource and and this is sort of giving you the different uh, uh, processes in place when you, you outsource, uh, you, you uh, gather information, you do the initial setup, uh, you, uh, you have your advisor prepare the TB doc documentation and you might review the final work product. Whereas if you insource, you, you have a, um, a workshop on a piece of technology and you start doing it yourself. That's in short what it boils down to. Uh, a lot of our clients come to us and say, well, you know, we want a piece of software. We want to be trained on it, but basically for the first year, we don't have people to actually do it. So, so then uh, in, all, in, in almost all of our projects, we see, uh, we see that, that attitude, either there's, there's uh, uh, not enough people or not enough trained people uh, uh, available, which means if we offer uh, uh, the outsourcing model, we always add technology and we always like to hand over after one year the license to the client for the client to take full ownership and uh, accountability to the extent possible. And, and at, at that stage, the handover will be to a very designated people function. Uh, which might be one of the four roles we uh, we uh, we looked at uh, uh, and, and Jeff talked about uh, a minute ago. So so this is another um, um, often seen discussion we have with clients, and then uh, they want to compare, they want to have uh, the the business case built. They they need to get the the buy-in from the CFO on on things like this. So this is the whole cycle of insourcing versus outsourcing. Um, Jeff, any any observations from your practice on, on this dilemma in sourcing, outsourcing? Um, no, what I normally tell client, you know, outsourcing has its place definitely to cover short term resource gaps or an immediate need that you can't do yourself. You know, legislation change, you quickly need to react to it. 
Um, however, I think long-term outsourcing is never a long-term solution. Um, you need to be bringing it in-house. And the simple reason for that is, is that over time, the tax authorities are going to have a view, a digital view of your company that if you don't have that same view, you're not in a position to defend yourself effectively. Um, yep. If you send your data uh, out of house, that's not going to help you. So um, really more insourcing and replacing outsourcing with co-sourcing should be the model going forward as you digitalize your tax function. So it basically means uh, following the, the model PPA has uh, one year of, of uh, setting up a, a system, handing over the license key, uh, yet in, in in, in case peak burdens on compliance uh, still run uh, at the client's desk without capacity, uh, we, we step in because we're allowed to run on the same digital platform. And then you get to the cold sourcing model Jeff is uh, alluding to. Okay. Um, on the next slide, uh, what you see is a part of the proposal at PPA submitted recently for a VAT technology solution. The client wanted to automate certain VAT workflows. And this uh, diagram shows the uh, main phases of implementing a VAT technology solution. In this case, uh, it was uh, for a program called the R7, which is developed, developed by uh, one of our VAT technology partners, um, Signet. In this uh, project, it was very important to determine the extent of integration of the current business process on the VAT workflows. And in determining, in determining the workflows, it was suggested that uh, we first have, uh, before we be even begin uh, the project, we have a, a one-day um, session on RACI workshop to identify um, the workflows and the right stakeholders responsible for the workflows. And it was uh, very uh, important to uh, determine the extent of the VAT process that the client wanted to achieve uh, automatically for, um, for the automation. Would you like to add anything to uh, that, just say? Yeah, I think the uh, in this particular case, the client started off with saying, okay, uh, HMRC in the UK as of April 1 wants, uh, wants uh, us to to uh, deliver a digitized that uh, re uh, to its mailbox. So, so how do we get from that set of requirements back into um, a a ERP system which is already slightly outdated? And while doing that sort of backtracking from the the, the VAT uh, requirements, the UK VAT filing requirements. Uh, um, as of April 1, uh, to the data set, we, we stumbled into various issues like uh, what the, the, the no clear RACI in place, so uh, the manual entries were being made, which corrupted the, the ultimate assessment of, uh, of, of transaction, not only transactional, but also aggregated data sets. So if you uh, were, were clearing data sets from an aggregated level and you used various sources, there were differences in the amounts uh, recognized. And, and one of the differences were, well, local controllers do the following bookings. Well, who authorized the local controllers to do the following bookings? Uh, so in, in this whole uh, process, uh, and, and grinded in this whole process, is the, the racy around people functions. If, if you don't have that analyzed and streamlined, then that's, that's sort of what uh, the, uh, the, the, the process here uh, talks about as well. Then it's it's very hard to uh, to to get to a successful implementation. So the RACI matrix clarify governance and identify workflows, which is in the first box, was almost the major improvement in the process and the, the people roles and responsibilities and the, in the process to get to a proper technology solution. In the next section, we will uh, talk about uh, um, how to manage a transformation uh, process. 
And uh, as with uh, any uh, transformation project, not just a uh, um, technology project, uh, uh, you will need a, a clear plan. So before you implement any uh, transformation uh, project, first you need to understand your company's business and plan your roadmap and list the prior priorities per phase. Um, this is because your you may have a budgeted uh, limit limited budget and you may want to achieve certain uh, tasks or objectives before others. And it's very important to uh, communicate to both the tax and non tax functions involved in the project. And now I'll give the floor to Jack, who will take us through um, how you can prepare for change towards uh, digitalization. Is there any questions, uh, Emily, already, or did we allow the floor to raise some questions? Um, there are no questions yet. No questions so far. So please use the, the question button if you if you have any questions so far. Jeff, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so as I'm looking at our own presentation, actually, a um, couple of things occur to me here, um, and that is that uh, some very practical steps here. There is also, you know, if you talk about um, having a tax data lake that is a 360 degree virtual reality view of your entire organization through tax tinted glasses, that thing doesn't really quite exist yet, or at least you can't buy it as a third party product. There's, there's several companies who've tried to build their own tax data lakes. Um, so overall, in terms of change management, we're talking about a journey. Um, and it's important to understand uh, what type of journey that is. And the way I would describe it is this, is that first of all, you establish a vision. You know, where is it we want to go? And people, process, and technology is right there as a big part of that vision and data as well. But then, how do you, uh, once you've got that vision, how do you get there? Well, you use stepping stones. So the way you approach that is you say, okay, well, from where I am today, I have a vision. Which is the next stepping stone that I'm going to take? And you have a choice of stepping stones. So you take the one that you think is going to push you in the right direction towards your vision. And when you then take the step and get onto that stepping stone, then you look at your choice of what the next one is. This is not a defined journey that's step one, two, three, and can be defined fully up front. Um, it's a journey that's going to mold and change over time. But it very much in terms of setting that vision out in the beginning, um, then it's a theme that's run through this whole presentation. People, process, and technology is a big part of it. Um, which also means uh, demoting the idea of enterprise process automation. And the trouble with process automation, which is, by the way, being the dominant thought process so far, is that as human machines can do what people can do, and of course they can't. And it ignores, generally ignores the ignores digital data altogether, which is, um, you know, the biggest asset that you have uh, in a digital tax department. Um, so process automation in the traditional sense makes data into a problem instead of an asset. Um, so the automation remains important going forward, but just has to be seen in a new context that works better than before. So how do we get started with this? Can we go to the next slide, please, Emily? So uh, what we need to do is marry what the tax authorities are doing, uh, uh, digitalization initiatives across the globe with the real initiatives that take place in a tax function and avoid the, the pitfalls that befell others. Um, and that is the purpose of something that um, has been introduced called the UX day or the user experience day. Now that user experience day is designed as the first step on a new set of stepping stones on a road to a digitally aware and, and tech savvy tax function. Uh, and at the end of it, if we've done our job correctly um, at, the, at the user experience day, then it will give you a new vision. Um, and that's good, but what will the actual outcomes be of a user experience day? So can we go to the next slide, please, Emily? Well, uh, Jeff, uh, one, one, one point on this slide. Uh, that another way of reading this same slide is if you see the plan on the left side um, you created, 
and if you see the demand uh, of, of tax and technology driven data sets the tax authorities ask from you then there's a gap why because typically we see corporates making a plan and then uh, uh, saying this looks very nice and we could present it at uh, the, the CFO level and then we walk away and do our micro projects uh, subsequently. I, I think this slide sort of defines that the plan should be heavily, uh, should be relying on a, on a, a dynamic version of the tax technology plan to be able to cope with the permanent new initiatives uh, tax authorities come up on a, on an almost daily basis. So the, the question we always ask our clients is, okay, you have a plan, so who of you in the tax department or the finance department tracks these tax technology alerts? And tax technology alert stands for any movement uh, at the level of the tax authorities in any of the 30 countries you deal with for VAT, for corporate income tax, for transfers, it doesn't really matter who tracks that. So at least you can keep your uh, your plan on traction at the right speed in the right direction with the right intensity. That That is what I call the dynamic version of your tax technology plan going forward. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Steve. Yeah, so the vision is all well and good, but you need to have practical steps coming out of it. So um, the first one here is define your A team to close that gap that Steve was just talking about. So what is that? It might be a combination of your existing internal people, maybe some new external people, SOW with a consultancy or gig yeah. consultants are becoming more popular. It's a, again, a light version of, of the old SOW. Um, the second bullet point here, connect humans with the IT component. Critical, of course, this has been the long-standing complaint that the distance between the two has been too great and nobody knew how to bring them together. So we do that by helping you see what digital awareness and tech savviness actually means. And lastly, um, that leads right to a route to a possibly uh, an upgraded career path. Um, where you are in a position to stay relevant as digital becomes more important, boost your value and bestride digital tax with confidence. So uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So let's just let's start to summarize the presentation a little. So what's happening? We're seeing a decay of the labor intensive compliance processes. Tax leadership is being asked to position tax as a business enabler, and technology is the mechanism by which you, you enable, uh, you become a business enabler. Less planning and more risk management um, as authorities become more and more, get a build up bigger profiles of what you're doing. And a move from practicing tax to serving tax via technology. So these are the things we actually see are happening. So that raises a bunch of questions. These questions actually came from external, they didn't come from us. So how do I keep myself up to date? Where am I now and where do I want to be two years from now? What percentage of tax flows are digitalized and run through software technologies? Uh, and lastly, how do I go about upskilling to stay relevant? So these are all things that um, are addressed as part of user experience day. Next yeah, slide. what we uh, what we see in the um, in the the whole scheme of things when we look at people trained at university level, I I, I know there's one tax and technology professor here at the University of Amsterdam. I'm, I'm sure there's another four or five professors like that. Uh, so, so the traditional curriculum at university trains people on tax, not on tax and technology. So there's a gap when when people start practicing tax. There's a gap on on the combination of tax and technology. This user experience day brings it to the surface and and gives you a reflection moment on your own capabilities. I'm a good tax person. Am I also going to be a good tax and technology person? Uh, going forward, uh, that that's the big question. I think you find back in, in this 
this lineup. Uh, Jeff, is that a fair summary? Yep, I absolutely agree. Thank you, Steve. So and what, uh, what's in it for you? Um, so the tax technology field and certainly the digitalization, the digitalized version of it is relatively new. Um, there really is no established literature. We're trying to pull together the literature that is available at the moment. Um, and not much on best practices, um, although there is some information out there, but not very much yet. Um, the materials that are available tend to lack practical examples. So uh, what you get during the UX day, um, we will define possibilities and challenges for the future. Um, and I'm literally just walking through these six boxes. Train your software configuration skills. And we do that by hands-on experience. And maybe stay if you wanna say a little bit about that at the end. Want to assess your career profile through self-assessment. Run through the attributes of the new tax professional's workflows. Focus on doing, not listening. That's the hands-on piece. And test your experience level on new technologies. So um, again, just to reiterate, um, if we see the tax functions journey and the tax professionals journey towards digital tax as a series of stepping stones, then this is the first stone. Like I say, we're not defining the whole journey, um, but this to me is the, the best idea and the best representation I've seen of taking that first step, starting to develop that vision um, about what a digital tax function will look like in the future and the journey you will need to take to get there. Okay. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Steve? Yeah, I think the the the, the uh, a linear thinking of a lot of people on tax and technology is okay. I I do a reverse engineering. I need this VAT uh, digital VAT uh, form in the UK. So I'm a reverse engineering. Uh, I re reverse engineer where the data needs to come from, and I draw a straight line into into the VAT return. I I think um, what what you're then missing is that also in finance and in, in IT configuration, there's a stack of software uh, legacy uh, new uh, uh, layers on top of an ERP. Which, which all deal with uh, the, the, the functionality at hand. So it gives you the stack of software from source of data to reporting of, uh, of a VAT return runs through a couple of stacked software systems. So if you don't recognize that, you think with one solution, that's the holy grail, but it, it never is. So, so one of the tests during the user experience day is a, um, a tax uh, software configuration skills test uh, developed by by uh, by uh, one of our our uh, IT partners, which takes you from the bottom layer of data, uh, ERP or non-ERP, all the way in four, five, six steps to the reporting unit, which is your UK VAT return, and it allows you from all software packages in the world to drag and drop what is the right stack of software configuration you're looking at. And based on, on whether the stack of software systems actually talk to each other or not, you get a, a high score. Obviously, if you, if you uh, miss, uh, do a complete mismatch, you get zero scores on, on that test. So that's one illustration where a lot of people think very linear, this is my problem, refers back, this is my data, I need the software to connect uh, the, the output with the input, and that's it. But that's not how the, the world of, uh, of stacking of software, or as it is called here, train your software configuration skills, is really about. And that, that simple test as part of the user experience day just gives you a different multi-stack software uh, perspective to what what works and what doesn't work. Uh, it even makes tax people a little bit IT savvy like myself. Okay, uh, we're right near the end, uh, just about at the top of the hour. So I think um, 
before we start people start having to drop off um if people are interested in the user experience day emily do you want to give them an idea about what action they take yes sure um so we are actually um organizing a, a usa experience day and we were planning for a physical workshop but of course uh, due to the current uh, covid situation um, we have decided uh, that uh, we would uh, organize a, a virtual um, UX uh, day, and uh, we are aiming to prepare for it, say, uh, mid-May, is that right, say? Um, or to June, and uh, registrations will be available um, from uh, May, and we would also uh, post more information on the registration um, via LinkedIn, Twitter, and our Facebook. Yeah, exactly. So the this is Playbook 1. Each two weeks, we will run uh, the the full series of three playbooks uh, so you get the full picture on tax and technology and then as of mid-may uh, if you want to be alerted i think rosanna her email our marketing lady her email is on uh, on one of the slides you can uh, send her uh, a reminder to to keep you in uh, in line uh, with uh, with the mailing around which starts mid-may for an early June, mid June um, uh, user experience day, and that, that will be multiple user experience days. Uh, since it's virtual, it's very scalable uh, to a lot of locations as well. So that's uh, that's almost uh, the, uh, the the virtual reality we uh, we are uh, we are living in today. So yeah. Um, on that note, uh, I. Have received a couple of questions. Um, do we have time to address uh, one or two questions? One question, I think. Yeah. Uh, one person has asked, uh, have you observed patterns in the digita digi digitization path depending on the size of companies or scope of tax departments, uh, more corporate operation focus, uh, slash location and culture of multinational enterprises? Yes. Jeff, you're still there? Oh, yeah, sorry. I, th I thought you said Stafe. The trouble is, Stafe and Jeff, Jeff sound. <laughs> yeah, if you hear a total distance, it's the same. Huh? So, um, I'm sorry, Emily, you're going to have to repeat the question to me. I really didn't hear it well enough. Yeah. I think you can see it in the control box, but just in case you can't see it, the I question can't is. See the control box, actually. Yeah. So the not? question is Have you observed patterns in the digitization path depending on size? of companies or scope of tax department? Uh, yeah, the simple answer is yes. Um, and the larger companies have the bigger problem. Um, so they are the ones who, who take on uh, digitalization first. Um, and again, the more complex, so probably the most, some of the most complex companies we see out there would be conglomerates that are supply chain, um, so typically, um, manuf manufacturing done in the Far East, shipped through uh, distribution centers all over the world, transfer price through tax-friendly locations and distributed in every, planet, every country on the planet um, across multiple product lines with spares, returns, and all those kind of things. So that, that gets incredibly complex, and they are the companies that are under the most stress. Um, so they obviously have the big, biggest problem and take it on first. Um, other companies um, have problems with just sheer data quantity. And I'll give you an example there is Starbucks. Um, every time somebody buys a cup of coffee, another line appears in their SAP. So just dealing with the quantity is unbelievable. So they have a different problem. Um, the answer, the, the basic answer to this question is that no two companies are the same. As much as you try and put a playbook together, it has to be interpreted by skilled practitioners. Um, the smaller companies have less issue, and as you get right down to small and medium-sized businesses, quite often a good piece of modern software, uh, Zero comes to mind, and some of the other ones do a, do an awful lot now. But again, it always helps to get in a second opinion from somebody like us who is technically aware. Um, so that would that would be my answer to that question. Very good. Uh, I think that's 
sort of closes the session in light of time. Yeah, there are other questions, but please, uh, just, uh, given the time uh, uh, limit, uh, please uh, send us uh, these questions directly to our TPA, and uh, we will try to uh, our, do our best to answer the question. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and uh, special thanks to Jeff. Thank you. <laughs>